Hey, everybody. Hello, hello. Oh, my goodness. We are going to have a fun chat today. I have been just kind of enjoying <laughs> all of the ideas of what might be inside Lenny's spell cabinet. So if you have not joined us before and you're new to this whole discussion, we are going to be counting down to the Witch's Door, which is the second book in the Witch's Key series. Now this cover is going to be different from the one you see on the thumbnail because this cover will be changing in a couple of weeks. But this is the book that we read together last year during pandemic time. And I have been spending so much time, I had to take a break from this series in order to work on, you know, the Fate Surrender book, which then took me forever, epic adventure. But now I am back to working on The Witch's Door and all the ideas are coming and it's making me so excited to play around with the ideas of the world building for this. And, you know, when I start a series, I often have an idea of what's the characters, what's the world. So far, I have never like planned out an entire world like before I started writing. And I didn't do that with The Witch's Key either, because as many of you know, if you've been around for the beginning of that whole process around this time last year, like last March, I did not anticipate that this would be a series. So <laughs> I was kind of just having fun and enjoying the creative process when I first started setting it up. But the same as with my Shadow Demon Saga, once I start getting into book two and three, and who knows beyond maybe or just two, or we'll see, you know, we're going to play it by ear. It gets more and more interesting to go deeper into the world building, which is one of my absolute favorite things to do as an author is really like building up the world showing the ins and outs of daily life as a witch and how it's different. And <laughs> LA says, ah, oh, silly Sarah, they're all going to be series. I know I do try. And it's so funny because I was telling my husband, George, of course you guys know him, but I was telling George that it would be so fun to or not fun, but maybe easier for me to write more of an episodic series where you just have like an investigation and there's one case and every book stands alone. And he's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he's listening to all my ideas. And he's like, yeah, but that's not how it would turn out. And I'm like, it would. And he's like, it never would ever turn out that way. <laughs> And he's like, if you remember back in the days of writing Beautiful Demons and the Shadow Demon Saga, that's what you thought it would be too, is every episode or every book would be a different case that Harper has to solve. And if you've read that series, we are working on book 11 coming up this spring. And yeah, things just do not always go as planned. And as, as I started saying here, and George has said to me for a long time, the muse always wins. <laughs> Listen to George, the knower of all. George is always right. It is true. He is kind of my muse. Oh, yes, we're back to three times a week. I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> nope has to have a Sarah hanger. It's so true. It's just like you have to embrace who you are. And there are times where I think, gosh, it would be so much easier if I didn't have to build these deeper worlds. And I could just say, here's a story. And then here's another story. And then here's another story. And I just, you know, wouldn't have to go so deep into the character arc or the cliffhangers or the storylines and maybe the plot would be easier. But in the end, you have to just do you, right? You have to do what comes naturally. And for me, what I am surrendering to is the fact that yes, things always become a series. There are always cliffhangers. And I really do love the process of world building. So as we count down to the reading of The Witch's Door, I do not have a date yet. I'm hoping that I can start reading it by next Friday, but we'll see because I do want to be several episodes ahead. So I have it's undetermined. It will start within the next couple of weeks one way or another. But we are going to have some interesting discussions as a sort of countdown to the beginning of The Witch's Door. So some of it will be recap stuff of what happened in the first book, because I know for some of you, it's been almost a year since you read it. And some of it will just be going deeper into the world building or why I like this kind of thing, um, why I decided on a spell cabinet and things like that. So welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here to talk about this. So I have gathered some things from my own little witchy spell cabinet up 
upstairs. I have also dog eared some places in the book where Lenny talks about her spell cabinet that I'm going to kind of read to refresh your memory on. And I've also prepared a little slideshow as one does <laughs> with some pictures of what's in Lenny's spell cabinet. Just some ideas, right? Um, so Tracy said, do you have a world building video, Sarah? I don't exactly have a world building video. I have in my how to write a series series. I do have a little like world building workbook that goes along with that. So if you go to the playlist on my heart breathings channel, um, to see about, um, the, I think it's called How to Write a Series is the name of the playlist. And in there towards the end, I talk about world building and the types of elements that you need. So it's it's sort of tucked in there away to it. Um, and yes, Janet is making notes for my wiki and she's been reading through and now she's going to add things to it as we <laughs> talk about it here today. Um, so Kat asked, this is a good intro question too, is what is a spell cabinet? So if you have not read The Witch's Key, you might not be familiar with what I'm talking about as a spell cabinet. So in my series here, or in the first book, we have Lenora Thorne, who is a young witch, and she's a high school aged witch. Her, she's lost her parents, and now she has been sent to live with her Uncle Martin. And she's been with him all summer, and her key has been taken away from her. So in this particular world, every witch that is part of this one sort of order that's under the law of the witch is council, so it's like their coven, has a key, and that key restricts their magic to some degree. But the key is tied to a spell cabinet. And so what we're going to talk about today is what is this spell cabinet? What all is inside of it? Not super detailed, but a little bit. Um, and we are going to talk about why you would have those things. And of course, I'll be taking any ideas that you guys might have that might be something creative of how what else I could add to this, because it will be an ever uh, expanding type of thing. So I know that some readers think that when an author comes, you know, <laughs> comes with a book, like we just know everything about the world. But and that is probably true for some authors that before they start writing, they know everything about the world, even if it doesn't make it into the book. But for me so far with my bigger series, it's kind of a discover the world as we go sort of thing. So if Lenny doesn't know it about her spell cabinet yet. I don't know it yet either. And she will discover it as I discover it. So there are always more ideas and interesting things. And even just as we were talking about the um, spell cabinet and what I was going to talk about today earlier, George had some really cool ideas. And I was like, I can't put that in the book yet because they will, or I can't talk about it now because that would be a cool thing to learn as you read the book. So I don't want to have any spoilers too much. Hi, Nilda. Welcome. But it will be kind of fun to talk about it. So Elizabeth says, think kitchen, a magical spell cabinet is a witch's pantry in real life. Exactly. And of course, those of us who do use these types of tools in our normal everyday life, like I told you, I have some here. I do actually have a little bit of a spell cabinet of my own. And this came, I talked about this earlier. There's a vlog here on my channel from back like last April, if you want to go check it out. But this spell cabinet idea originally developed in for George and I because we knew we had a little baby and we were looking for what could he get me for our 10 year wedding anniversary that would be something I didn't have yet but something I would use on a daily basis that wasn't like a business gift. So a lot of times when we give each other gifts or I buy myself my own gifts sometimes it ends up being like a camera or a new computer or or a new microphone or something that I need for my business or my YouTube channel. So he wanted to get something that was more romantic. So after talking through a lot, we decided it would be really cool to buy some kind of cabinet that we could put all of my sort of witchy things inside because we knew we were going to have eventually at the time, we just had a little three month old, but we knew eventually she would become a crawling, get into everything although we were not quite prepared for how much get into everything, but we knew she would get into everything and we would need a way to kind of close off my crystals and other things that would be 
a little bit tempting for tiny little hands to want to put into her mouth and things like that. So what we decided on was we just went, literally, we went to Home Goods. This was not an expensive, like antique thing. Maybe it will happen in the future. But we went to Home Goods and for like, I don't know, $100, we bought this little cabinet that would be normally maybe like a side table for somebody's bed or something like that. And so it has three little levels to it and then a top. And that has been one of my favorite, favorite places. He also got for me a little meditation mat that is like a buckwheat meditation mat. And it is my favorite, favorite thing every single night to to sit down and have some meditation time in front of that cabinet. And so as I was sitting there, when I was first putting it all together, this is right before I started writing The Witch's Key. He got this for me in December of 2019. And then of course, early 2020, none of us knew there were like whispers of something called a coronavirus happening in China. And I actually have been going back in my five-year journal and seeing what I wrote last year. And it was like, oh, there's this virus, but hopefully it's not gonna make its way to the United States. Um, and of course we all know how that went, but this was before all of that. And I started meditating there and I had already had, it, you know, in the interest of avoiding spoilers, I had already had in my mind a long time ago, this spell circle scene in my head. And, I knew that it belonged to a story and I knew some things about, it knew it was going to be kind of a twist of the story, but I didn't know what story it belonged to or how it would fit into my life. And this was something I had imagined probably five or six years ago. And sometimes that's the way stories are is like you just kind of get a glimpse of an idea or a scene or a character, but you don't know. And it kind of has to just live inside your soul for a little while. And then eventually it's like, that's the idea. That would be really cool. And I was, so I had that previous idea. And then one day I'm sitting in front of this little spell cabinet of my own. And I started having sort of like a vision for lack of better word. And this happens, I think, to a lot of us as writers, uh, that we will see a vision of a character doing something. And I just could imagine this young character with really long hair sitting in front of this large cabinet, much bigger than the one that I have, and sort of meditating in front of it as she looked up on all of these like apothecary type items. And I thought, how cool would it be to write some sort of, you know, story along those lines. So then that's kind of those two ideas came together to create the witch's key. And then of course, as we say, the rest is history. But pulling out this little slideshow that we have. So basically in this particular world, like I said, there are a few things that we know already about Lenny's spell cabinet. So one of them is that it is a mahogany cabinet. So I'm going to read to you just a little bit of this piece from, these are just going to be like teeny pieces of scenes that are from the original book for those of you who haven't read it or visited it in a while, or for those of you who have not read this series yet. Um, at this point, she, this is kind of from the very first chapter of the book. She has been staying with her uncle Martin, like I said, and her key was taken away from her because the witches council who controls their magic is, has been doing kind of an investigation to make sure that she had nothing to do with the death of her parents and all this stuff. So here is the scene where he gives her her key back. So he says, there's one more thing, of course, if you're ready for it, he said as he slipped the locket around my neck and fastened it. I gasped as a silver key slid down the chain to rest next to my mother's locket. I nearly laughed with joy. Does this mean what I think it means? I asked, twirling around and grasping the key with both hands. So now she has her key back and she knows now because she has her key, she is free to use her magic. So that's one of the things that we learn right here from the beginning is that if she does not have her key, because this is all like kind of controlled by this overall council of the coven, if she doesn't have her key, she's not allowed to use her magic. Now, whether or not 
she can use her magic is not exactly answered, but she's not allowed to use her magic because of the rules of the coven. So that's an important distinction. So when she gets it back, she's, she says, thank you. And then she says, I turned and ran out the door. There was no time for pancakes if I wanted to try out my key before school. Lenora, where are you going? Martin called after me, but I was already halfway back up the stairs to my room. I sat down in front of the large mahogany cabinet I'd been given when I was just five years old and crossed my legs underneath me. I took a deep breath and placed a fingertip on the silver key, making sure my intentions were clear as a bell. I was out of practice after a few months, but apparently using a spell cabinet was like riding a bike. Once you learned how to do it, you never really forgot. The cabinet door swung open before me and I giggled with excitement at the sight of all my herbs and potions and gemstones, my collection of tarot cards. It was like seeing old friends again. I clasped my hands together. So what spell should I cast first? So... That gives us a little bit of information about what this spell cabinet is in this particular world. So the council oversees their magic, but when you're a young witch in a family inside this you know, world or inside this coven, when you're ready or they feel you're ready, they gift you one of these spell cabinets. And we don't really know a lot else about it. We know that it was gifted to her by the witch's council. Oops going on without me when she was just five. So that's pretty young to get such a huge one. And maybe this isn't when I describe it, this might not be in the picture, the exact one, you know, I had to just kind of find a picture that I could online, but it will look something like this. So a mahogany is a really dark, deep wood. And it's, this is a, not something that was just, at least in my mind, this isn't in the book yet, but in my mind, this is not something that was created for Lenny when she was five years old. This is something that is ancestral. So it's something like maybe it was her great, great, great grandmother's spell cabinet. And when she's ready, she gets this cabinet. Kind of the same way that the queen kind of gifts these titles when, you know, when the princes get married or whatever, they become the duke of such and such. This is kind of like maybe there's all of these different spell cabinets that exist in your ancestral line. And when you're ready, they kind of pair you with the right one in a, in a similar way, maybe to how the Harry Potter wands work, except those aren't necessarily ancestral, but just that there's, there's a wand for every person. And in the same way, there's a spell cabinet for every witch. Um, and of course, in this world also, it's not, which does not just mean a girl. Uncle Martin has his own spell cabinet as well. Um, but we know that it's opened in this particular case by a witch's key. So all of her tools and herbs and potions and gemstones that she mentioned are inside the cabinet. And she's the only one who can access them as far as we know. And it's tied to this key that she wears that she's now gotten back. Items and tools inside it are restricted by your key. So that's something else that we learn a little bit later in the story so that more items open to you as you advance in rank. So for example, uh, we hear at that very first scene that Lenny's key is just not ornate. It doesn't have gemstones, it's just a plain silver key. So because she just has that kind of first level key, she doesn't have access to like all the magic in the world. She only has access to a few certain things. And some of those things were passed down by her parents. Some of those things are just um, like the basic kind of like the basic witch's kit, <laughs> so to speak. But some things are restricted. So like, let's say maybe there was like a... Um, a poisonous sack or something like that from a, a certain kind of spider. She might not have access to that because that magic is too advanced for her. Um, and that is one of the ways the world is built in this series. So just another little 
scene here. So this is from a chapter a little ways on called There Are No Coincidences, where she mentions the spell cabinet again. So she is curious about this guy, Kai. So her friend Peyton has gone missing and she's not supposed to be looking into the disappearance of her friend and some other girls in the story, but, or in this town, but this is Lenora and she does what she wants. She's very headstrong, just like most of the female characters that I write. They, they do their own thing. I need a t-shirt that just says, I do what I want. Um, but she is kind of spying on this guy, Kai, because she thinks maybe he had something to do with it. So she has stolen his straw from Serbine, which is the local coffee shop. She says, I fished the straw out of my bag it was still wrapped in the napkin, so hopefully any DNA Kai had transferred to the actual straw was still there. This was my first reconnaissance mission, and I didn't want to screw it up. I disappeared into my large closet and rifled through some of my father's books. It took longer than expected to find the book on identifying magical creatures, but I finally found the spell I was looking for. So this is going to be important in just a second. Over the past few years, my parents had taught me a lot, mostly by showing me what they were working on. I was smart and I caught on pretty quickly, but Martin was right. There was still so much I didn't know. I'd seen my parents use this particular magical spell a few times in the past to verify a creature's identity, so I was hopeful I would be able to replicate it on my own. I sat down on the floor in front of my spell cabinet and took a deep, centering breath. When I felt ready, I lifted my finger to the silver key I wore next to my mother's locket. With clear intention, the spell cabinet door swung open, revealing all of my tools. Like any good witch, I'd been collecting magical items since I was about five years old. When he or she is ready, every witch in our coven is gifted with a spell cabinet by the witch's council, and it's up to her to decide what she wants to fill it with. Within reason, of course. Certain types of magic were forbidden until you'd unlocked the next key. Over the years, I'd chosen to fill mine with various herbs, salts, gemstones, and spell components we'd found on our travels. I also had a section at the top that housed my favorite deck of tarot cards, a small cauldron, a mortar and pestle, and a sage smudge, naturally. So we have some important information comes to light there in that little scene right there. So this is a good kind of indication, but it is interesting, like I said, to note that when she goes to get her father's spell books, they are not in her spell cabinet. They're in a closet, right? So my idea with that, and of course, I'll elaborate more on this sort of thing in the future. But my idea with this is inside a witch's spell cabinet, she needs to have things that belong to her. It's her choice. It's almost like a almost like a familiar relationship where you've got the witch with her black cat, you have the witch with her spell cabinet and her spell cabinet is like her, a part of her extended self. And as she grows in her own magic and gets the next level key and access to the next level magic, she then also can fill it up with new types of reagents and spell components and potions and things that she might not have had access to in the past. But I have this kind of idea that she wouldn't really normally put her father's spell books in her cabinet, even though he's passed on and it's, it's hers now, it would be in my mind, her job or her responsibility to have her own spell books that she copies things over into. And that would be sort of an idea of a kind of a ritual of, you know, this is her book of shadows. This is her, um, personal space, so to speak. Um, now there, but then I also have an idea that maybe the spell book might be slightly different. So like maybe the mortar and pestle that she uses is something that was passed down from generations too. So it could be something along those lines. And I'll explore that more as I write, but I just have this idea that there is this sort of, uh, 
familiar relationship or more than just a dead item. <laughs> There's a living relationship between Lenny and her spell cabinet and every witch and their spell cabinet. Now, I don't say here specifically if Lenny was young to get a spell cabinet, but in my head, maybe five is a little bit younger than some witches get access because she is has been a little bit more advanced. Plus her parents were you know, well-traveled and they had specific jobs for the witches council. So they took her with them wherever she went. So, or wherever they went. So she may have access to different items that some witches whose parents kind of just stayed in one, one town would only have local items. She has kind of a world of items to choose from. So in this next part, we're talking about, so here's, here's basically some of the things that she would have in her, spell cabinet. First, she's got her tools, right? Tools of the trade, things that she would use. And of course, all of these things are tools, but in terms of actual tools, so you can see some of these photos are my own. I don't have a really great mortar and pestle. I do have one, but it's like really small and looks very modern. So I grabbed a picture of one that looks a little bit more antique, I guess. <laughs> um, but I also do have a little tiny little cauldron that you guys might have seen before. And you can see it in that photo there as well um, that I got from Lunam Love on Etsy. And I use this actively to burn like if I do certain kinds of rituals, um, like for New Year's Eve, I wrote down all of the amazing things that had happened in my life for the past year, anything that I needed, I felt I needed to forgive myself for anything that I wanted to say thank you to 2020 for bringing into my life or things I wanted to let go of. I wrote a long letter to 2020. However, that sounds a little bit kind of crazy, but yes. Um, and so when I was done with it and I had a little prayer, I burned that piece of paper in this tiny little cauldron because it's a little safe cast iron place. And mine has a little pinnacle on it, but you'll see um, cauldrons that have like a little, like a moon or the moon phases on it, or you'll see some that have um, other types of witchy types of symbols on them, but I loved the pinnacle. And it was kind of funny because I started burning it. And then I was like immediately, uh, because I had this kind of a big piece of paper and it had oil on it. And I was like, open the windows. We were afraid for a minute that I was about to set off the fire alarm, but luckily I did not. <laughs> so a cauldron is something that is a little bit of a must have for a witch, I would say. Um, and in, in that particular scene where Linny, where I was just reading where Linny is doing that little spell with Kai's stuff, she uses a cauldron as well. And I imagine that when she's talking about it, she says a small cauldron. So I imagine her cabinet has this little one in it. Um, another thing to mention about the cabinet and the way I see it because it's magical and you can do what you want, is that it's not necessarily limited in its space. So you might have this very large spell cabinet, but maybe like behind the doors, there's an extra door or a, a room enough for a giant cauldron, kind of like Mary Poppins bag, you know, that she pulls all these things out of. I can see the spell cabinet becoming more and more like that so that you're not limited to what ingredients you have and kind of like a witch always knows where to find different types of things, you know, because it's organized in just her certain kind of way. Um, so I believe that that is the magic of the spell cabinet. So you can see the little cauldron, you can see my little mortar and pestle down there. But like I said, it's just like a white porcelain one I think I got from a little shop here um, in Charleston. And so she's got those kind of tools. She would also have most likely and I'll just kind of change this perspective. She She's talked about a couple of times that she has her personal tarot cards that she uses. Um, and I would imagine if Lenny is anything like me, that she has multiple sets of tarot cards as well. Um, <laughs> yes, like Hermione's bag where she's got all the things in it. Exactly. It's kind of like a infinite, infinite bag. Um, and I think that would be a fun way to do it because otherwise, you know, witches might be limited to how big of a cauldron they might need or anything like that. So you've got your tools like that. Maybe you have a selenite wand or you've got a uh, mortar and pestle. Maybe you have different tens or maybe you have different uh, vials 
these I just got, if you're interested in this kind of thing, I got these at the Dollar Tree and I think there were maybe like eight in a pack for a dollar, but they can really make cute little spells if you want. So this was a little Yule spell that I did that has different little plants and bay leaves and things. And it's got a little note in there with my wish for the new year with a little bit of cinnamon and bark. And um, in, I don't know if you can hear that. <laughs> it also has some tiny little um, rose quartz in there as well. So this is not exactly the same ones, but they're similar. So little potion like in terms of tools she would have maybe like empty vials and things like that that she might she might need so that's some of the tools then when we go to actual reagents one thing for sure that she has is different herbs and of course she talks about this in her in the book we talk about this several times so some examples of the types of herbs that Lenny might have access to at her age or her stage of magic. And I grabbed this um, magical, this modern witchcraft guide to magical herbs, because I have just ordered this book from Amazon to do a little bit of extra research, because I think that would be kind of cool to really get in depth and really know not only for my own practice, but for learning more about what Lenny might be using. So things like blackberry vines, lavender, cloves, bay leaves, I do actually use bay leaves quite a bit here, at, you know, for myself and cinnamon, which I didn't put in there amaranth, angelica, basil, calendula, chamomile, comfrey, daisy, dandelion, eucalyptus, heather, garlic. And if you didn't know this, I just heard from Tanya, who is my, um, like very much, you guys hear me talk about Tanya. You guys know who I'm talking about. My tarot guru, my sort of tarot life coach. She talks about how um, if you don't have a sage smudge, something like this, then you could use um, garlic and you can take the skin of a garlic clove and you can burn it. And that is another way to sort of cleanse your space. So a lot of people will use kind of bringing this back over here. We'll use things like this, like sage smudges or Palo Santo or other types of things that, um, they will use to clear the space to create like take away negative energy and different things like that. So some things will cleanse and some things will actually take away. So it's really interesting. So uh, garlic is something that you could use if you don't happen to have a sage smudge. So interesting thing I did not know before. Cinnamon stick also works. I did not know that. Um, so Anne asked, what about her backpack? In some of the situations, she mentions her backpack, which is kind of like her spell cabinet. That is a really good question. So we'll talk about that in just a minute because I do have a little piece of a scene I'm going to read about her backpack. Um, but I wish I had included some pictures because I, I think that is an interesting topic. All right. So later, much later in the book, um, you can see kind of how far I am. Lenny is with Kai, said, said troublemaker Kai. Talking about the keys and the uh, spell book. So we'll just kind of talk about this a little bit here. I ran up to my room to grab my backpack. There you go, Anne. Not that it answers your question, but at least we're talking about it. And I took my time carefully packing it up with everything Gowan and Gianna had said I might need. Holy water, my father's dagger, a large bottle full of blessed salt. Hold on. This is not the right scene. Nope. Backtrack. I skipped a scene that I was going to read. This is the scene with Kai. Um, so he's there with her and they're trying to, you know, do things they're not supposed to be doing, meaning they're not supposed to be sticking their nose in the council's business looking for these girls. But of course, they're willful teenagers and they're going to do what they want. Um, so he says he paced the room making points on his fingertips. Well, for one, I'm 99% sure we're looking at a powerful demon who has sacrificed many other humans before. What are we going to do if we rush in there and encounter this guy? He asked, did you think about that? I bit my lip. No. 
Second, if Miss Greer has been watching you, it's possible the council is watching you too, independent of her ravens, he said. If they've just warned you not to get involved, how lenient do you think they'll be if they catch you spying on one of their keepers? I took a deep breath. He was right. I hadn't really thought through all the possibilities. I was just looking one step ahead and assuming Miss Greer would never know we were there. Okay, so what's the solution then? I asked, since you've obviously already given this some thought. Kai studied me for a second, and then he looked around my bedroom. A warm blush blossomed on my cheeks. Thankfully, I didn't have any dirty clothes or candy wrappers on the floor, but still, what was he looking for? His eyes landed on the mahogany spell cabinet. To anyone else, it would just look like a worn antique cabinet, but I could tell he recognized it right away. Do you have any blackberry vines in there? Amaranth? What kind of witch do you think I am? I asked, tilting my head to the side. He smiled. Okay, what about ashes from a cedar tree? I had to think about that one. I think so, I said. I had a faint memory of burning several different types of wood and leaves with my mother one afternoon a few years ago. Then you can just cloak your movements, he said. The council won't be able to see where you go tonight if you don't want them to. So basically, this is Kai, who she did not expect to know anything about her spell cabinet, but it just gives you another idea of the types of ingredients and things that might be in her spell cabinet. So there is just a quick look at those types of herbs. And, you know, maybe independent of herbs, she might have things like certain types of burned trees or burned leaves or other types of leaves. Um, there's also a part where she mentions, well, I'll talk about it later, but she also like that little part that I was reading just a little bit, she talks about how she was grabbing certain types of blessed salt. So another thing she might have inside her cabinet would be different types of oils or salts. So I have in my little cabinet upstairs, a few of them myself. So I have some um, I keep kind of changing focus here. I have some of those same little vials that I said I got from Dollar Tree full of different kinds of salt. So I have Himalayan pink salt. I have blessed salt. I have um, just regular sea salt. Some people will get like dead sea salt or, um, you know, there's black salt and other types of salt from different places in the world. So sometimes salt can be used to create a barrier or to create a spell circle or things like that. Um, you can also use oils for like dressing candles. So this is another oil that I got from Lunom Love that was called Awakening Support. And this is a ritual body oil that actually has quite a bit of glitter in it and it smells really good. It also has roses in it, but this was specifically in a, um, in a box that she did for the winter solstice for kind of like awakening your um, intuition and things like that. So I really enjoy this. And this one is an oil that is done with a dropper. Oops. With a dropper like this. Look at all that glitter. I love it. So cute. And you can see the little rose in there too. How pretty is that? Then I also have other oils like a money drawing oil. I have a road opening ritual oil that you can use to put on your crystals. You can put it on candles to dress them. Um, you can put it on your body. So that kind of stuff is pretty interesting. This also has some glitter in it and some various herbs. <laughs> so oils, I would imagine she has similar to mine. Like, And what I picture her spell cabinet, I definitely picture it being organized, not where there's just like, you know, salt here and a Arctic ice here and all that stuff. It would be like, here's all my salts in this. Like if you open up the cabinet, I couldn't find a really good picture of it, but I'll have to look harder for something. But I could imagine like when you swing open those doors that maybe on the like outside of the door, you would have these little rows of, of like, glass potions or salts or um, 
oils and they would all be like kind of lined up like here's all the salts at the top here's all the oils on the second thing you know and so on so that she can quickly kind of grab and i always imagine that for most of the witches that have these cabinets i'm sure there are some that have personalities where they're not as organized and so on but for most of these witches they should be able to instantly just reach in and grab it but you can see with Linny in this past scene that she's kind of like hmm i remember doing this with my mom but now it's been a couple of years, which brings up another topic that George and I were talking about. Oh, by the way, I had to wear this little I love witchcraft shirt that has like, because <laughs> she would maybe have a crystal ball too and candles and potions and things like that. Um, but the other part of it, or that's kind of a question is, would she like, how do all these things stay good for so long? Do you have to get, like, she talks sometimes that the blackberry vines were fresh, so they were more potent. So it's like, do does she have to replace these things all the time? Do they stay good? Like, if you ended up getting, like, a, um, like I was talking about, like, a poison sack from a certain kind of uh, spider, would it stay good or does it deteriorate over time or does it get more potent over time? And I think it would really depend on a case by case basis. So some things might get more potent over time, like certain kinds of salt or certain kinds of things that were like marinating or whatever, but other things might completely deteriorate or rot away. I would imagine too, since they're witches, that like if you were going to put something inside a bottle like this, let's say that you were going to try to keep a blackberry vine fresh, maybe you could dress it with a certain type of oil and leave it suspended in the oil. And then when you close the vase, you could put some kind of everlasting spell on it so that it wouldn't deteriorate or rot. And maybe that's something that Lenny doesn't quite have access to yet. I don't know. Things to think about. Again, not decisions that I have made yet. Another thing, of course, that she has, and this is not my photo, I got it from Pinterest. So if you go to my Pinterest, you will find it on a Pinterest board if you want to find the original credit of that. I do not have this many crystals, although they are beautiful. Um, but you would see, of course, that she would have lots of crystals too. So this could be anything from raw crystals like um, that are more like not tumbled, just more like raw edged crystals, or they could be polished crystals. And I actually just recently got a really pretty one. It's pretty green and that's more tumbled. It's very smooth to the touch. Some of them could be in certain types of shapes, like a point or like um, if you guys saw T Moana got me a pyramid one that I actually am using currently at my um, ritual space. Here's a fluorite, which I love. This came from my friend JD and it's got so much pretty like purple and green to it. I love it. But a lot of people believe that the shape of this with the point sends your magic or your intentions up um, so it gives you that kind of lift to your spells. So there's definitely different types of shapes that you can use. Another thing, this is was also a gift for my birthday from Timoana, which is a pendulum. So you might use this in divination where if you're trying to, um, you know, ask a question. She may have a divination cloth or something, which would be part of the tools if she wanted to have some kind of like maybe even a Ouija board if she wanted. I don't think that Lenny has one of those, but maybe some witches do. Um, some type of altar cloth or a pendulum. She may have some sort of um, like pentacle disc or, you know, whatever. Like you never know. There's also like, um, if you guys have heard of sacred geometry, which is this idea of things being put in certain um, like geometric shapes to enhance your spell work or your intentions. And people will put their crystals into these shapes. And there are boards and cloths and all kinds of things that show you kind of where to put everything. So maybe she would have something like that. So it'll be really, really fun. I feel like there's so many different parts that I can pull from our current world that witches use or people who use these types of tools that I might pull in for Lenny as well. But of course, crystals are, they have lots of different uses. So the same way that you could use herbs or oils for like healing or for 
amplifying your intentions or for cleansing a space, you can do the same thing with different types of crystals. So I would imagine, like I said, that she probably has some kind of little crystal ball or she might have a pendulum. She might have, like I said, like some kind of wand or um, be using like tiny little crystals in some cases, like you saw in this little, um, in this little bottle for spell work, but she also might have really big ones as well that she's gotten on her travel. So there's all kinds of possibilities of what she might be doing with crystals, which I think is pretty cool. Candles, of course, this is another one of my my photos, but you have lots of different things you can do with candles as well. So just in that picture, you can see I've got some chime candles. So these are often called chime candles and they don't, they're non-drip candles. And I just got these from Amazon, but they come in different colors. And supposedly the different colors have different like meanings. And I've also heard from people that you can use a white candle in uh, like, if you don't have colored candles, you can use a white candle and put your own intention into it. But if you want to strengthen your spell work, you can use different colors of candles. So I would imagine that inside Lenny's cabinet, she has multiple colors of candles. And I like the idea, like when I talk in that last space about her remembering going into the woods with her mother and burning things and putting them into vials and getting kind of like spell cabinet preparations or um, like Elizabeth was saying, like gathering things for your pantry, so to speak. I imagine too that Linny and many of the witches in her coven or in this council um, or under the realm of this council make their own candles. And that I think would be something really cool that we might, I've been kind of thinking on a scene for book two where she's going to be making some of her own candles as a sort of ritual thing that she's just always done with her parents. Um, so anyway, you've got the different colors of candles like this, like the photo, there might be jar candles that are actually part of a spell. So the candle that you see there is a candle that that mason jar candle is something again, Again, I got from Lunam Love. Um, you can see her name, I think, here, if I make this bigger. Um, you can see Lunam Love. It's L-U-N-A-M Love. That's an Etsy shop that I really like. She's done lots of like custom orders and candles and stuff for me. But this was a success and abundance candle. And so it has like specific oils, more glitter on top, of course. Um, it has crystals inside of it, different herbs inside of it, so that it's supposed to, like when you meditate on this candle, send your, like focus your energy and amplify your intention. And I just really love that. And I really, really love having candles for sure that are um, more than just like, these are fine, the little chime candles, but you can see even that candle in my photo there does have herbs and oils on it. So it's like a regular chime candle that's been dressed with extra things. Um, but I also have, and I think I've shown this kind of thing before. This is another one that Lunum Love has made for me that I have not used, but she made this um, particularly like in, I custom, um, what do you call that? <laughs> commissioned, I guess, her to make a set of candles for me to help me bring in a movie and television deal for the Shadow Demon Saga. So she made a full set of these candles and she's making these from scratch and she puts uh, different types of oils. And as she's making them, kind of like Janet just said, then she would really have the right intention in her candles if she made them herself. And I think that that is something really cool that you can do as a witch and that I think Glenny would definitely be doing is meditating and as she's creating her candle have it be kind of a spell work of its own just to create the candle she's not heading down to you know Walmart to go grab her candle she's making them herself and I think that would be really cool um, to show that process um, so I have some ideas for a scene but there's it just smells so good and when it when this burns this is not the kind of thing that you leave <laughs> <laughs> to yourself, um, like, like uh, by itself, you watch this kind of candle because it does have like herbs and other things in it. So it tends to burn quite bright most of the time. So I do have one final candle left for that set. So hopefully there will be a movie or TV deal coming within the next few months when I burn that last piece. Um, so we will see, I will keep you updated. <laughs> um, but 
the I saw that Jennifer said was the intention behind the jar candle. So the jar candle is like pros, prosperity and success. Um, I think she called it prosperity and success candle. And I don't think she has any currently in her store. But if you go and check her out, she's always adding new stuff as she makes it. And she does accept commissions. So if you have something very specific that you want to um, have her put into a candle for you, she will do that. It does obviously take more time that way, but it is a cool thing that she does. Um, so yeah, candles would be a cool thing, I think, for her to have. And I think it would be neat to see what types of herbs or spell work she does with her candles. And oh, that might be the last slide I have. Um, so a few other things that I have sitting here that might depend on where you're located. So remember I said like Lenny might have more stuff from all over the world because her parents were world travelers. Whereas like a local witch to Charleston here might have things like shells from the beach. So I, I, every time we go out, I always collect shells. Um, and I like, like most people are only looking for those big shells, like the giant, like conch shells or, um, like the scallop shells or different types of really big whole shells. And I, of course, look for those too. But I also think it's really fun to look for little tiny shells like this because they're fun to put into spell work because that like we all know the ocean has such a connection to the moon. And so it's just a neat thing to collect shells that come from your local beach to use. So a local witch to Charleston here might be using shells, whereas somebody where Lenny is might not be using shells and they might be using more of like different types of sand or dirt or um, like vines or herbs that grow in their local area. So I think that that would be a cool part of a spell cabinet as well as like local things that you love and use. Um, another thing might be incense. So other types of scents besides just oils, but maybe incense that she would burn to bring certain kinds of energy into her space and different colors of smoke might be something that she also might be using. <laughs> Diane says, I'm in Kansas. We need a live workshop on a coast. Yes, let's do a Charleston witchy workshop and you guys can all come visit. <laughs> um, I've shown this before. This is one of my personal kind of spells and this is just a mint tin, but I do imagine that maybe um, she would have little boxes that were maybe handmade boxes or hand carved boxes or even little tins or things like that, that would contain spells, ritual spells, or keys, or money, or anything that she was trying to, like little quartz, or whatever, like maybe she has little things like this that have different spells. Um, I was also thinking it would be cool for her to have something on her altar that was for that was sort of more ancestral, like I was talking about, like not her father's spell books, but something like, um, she wears her mother's locket, but maybe she would have something like um, her father's glasses or um, her, her mother's diamond ring or something like that, that sits in a specific place to, um, to like, I guess not necessarily commune with her family, but to kind of honor them with gifts and things like that. Um, so final little tiny scene that I'm going to read here is the one I was talking about earlier. So it talks a little bit about the backpack here. Um, so she says, I ran up to my room to grab my backpack and I took my time carefully packing it up with everything Gowan and Gianna had said I might need. Holy water, my father's dagger, which we know she grabs as well, a large bottle full of blessed salt. I checked off more than 15 different reagents as I loaded them into my bag. So here she kind of talks specifically about how the bag is arranged. And there will be more on this bag in the next book. So the inside of the backpack was arranged with small straps so that I could carry lots of different vials in a somewhat organized manner. So the way I kind of picture this, and I know this sounds a little bit silly, is I should have grabbed something. But the way that a planner will by the way, this is my new my new planner. How cute is this from uh, Kiki K? I love it. I know that light just got really dark, um, but how cool. Isn't that neat? It's very witchy. 
<laughs> I just I just finished setting it up today. But the same way that a planner will have this little elastic pin loop here, you can find inside this backpack lots of larger loops like that that might be snaps, like maybe they could be leather snaps or they could be elastic like that. So if you had a, a elastic um, pin loop kind of thing like that, you could slide this vial into it, right? And it wouldn't move or get mixed up and it would stay organized so that the vials aren't all clinking together. That's kind of how I picture the inside of this bag. Um, and I kind of see it rather than a bag that you open up and you can only reach in, like maybe it's a bag that kind of pulls open so that you can kind of see everything inside. I'm gonna have to see if I can find a photo of something similar online. So I'm glad you asked about that. I just worried that when the time came, I wouldn't be able to locate and use everything as quickly as I wanted. Gianna assured me that once I graduated to my second key, I would be able to cast more magic without the use of incantations and reagents. But she also said that about a hundred more ingredients would open up to me. A witch's key was more than just a key to a cabinet. It was a key to new magic and abilities too. You'll be on your second key before you know it if you keep this up, Gowan had said to me this morning during training. I had then asked him what level key he was on, and he'd simply given me a wink and tucked his key inside his white shirt, but not before I had the chance to see the three ruby stones embedded in its center. Now, as I packed up my bag, I grasped my own key and lock, and lock it tightly in my hand. My witch's key had no stone or fancy inscriptions. It was just a simple silver key, and tonight that would have to be enough. I knelt before my spell cabinet for a few minutes and closed my eyes. I sent up a prayer to whoever might be listening up there. It was a prayer I'd heard my parents say to each other many times before they had gone into battle. May my magic be quick and strong. May my aim always be true. May the light be on my side so that I may return home safe to you. So a little bit of a walk down memory lane <laughs> when we think about Liddy heading out to face this final battle and getting her planner or her planner. <laughs> yeah, it might be a planner getting her bag, her bag together, all of her spells and thinking through, but also taking that moment. Like I said, it kind of shows that relationship that this is a sacred space for her, that she kneels in front of the cabinet to say this prayer because it is it is like a portal for her to her magic. Um, and yes, I came up with that rhyme. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's kind of a neat thing to re be revisiting the witch's key world. And like I said, this will definitely be, um, it's, it's a work in progress. It's constantly evolving. So if any of you have ideas too, feel free to keep sharing them because you never know. Um, so Casey says you can look up alchemists bag in Google images and it will give you something similar to the pin loop thing you're talking about. I love it. So yeah, that is really, really neat. Um, so yeah, kind of like an organizer. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this kind of walk down memory lane. I also had some recent, so George had got me roses and a friend of mine had brought me some Gerber daisies for my birthday. So I have been drying them and collecting them in this little bag. So she would maybe have different types of flowers and you know, some of them might be in little sachets and some of them might be already in bottles or um, in little canisters. There's probably all types of ways that she could store this stuff. And I cannot wait to further explore it and really go deeper into it. Um, and we'll see kind of how it all turns out. But I hope that you guys are excited for book two. If you have not started this series, The Witch's Key is available to purchase everywhere. Amazon, you know, everywhere ebooks are sold, basically Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Google Play, all of those places. Um, if you would prefer to read it for free, I did read the rough draft of the story as I was writing it here on YouTube. So you can just find that playlist. And I know that I chat a lot at the beginning and the end. So what I've done for you throughout that whole playlist is if you go to the very first pinned comment underneath the video, it has a little timestamp there that you can click on to go straight to the reading. So it will help you kind of make your way through a little bit faster. It's also available for you over on Wattpad to read for free as well as my website at sarahcannon.com slash blog.
then coming up soon, we will be actually reading The Witch's Door live. So I'm going to do book two the same way that I did book one, where we will be reading it as I'm writing it here on this channel. So it will be a rough draft, but it will be live. Then I will also have it available for purchase and do some exclusive paperback signings when the book is done. And I anticipate that it will be, the readings will be finished sometimes near the very end of March or April. So we'll be starting to read in the next couple of weeks and they will go all through the month of February and all the way through to the end of March. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so she says, do you know what level Gowan's key is? I do, but I'm not going to tell you um, because there is, there, there are some extra, um, it's too spoilery for sure, but I do know. And the, the level of the key depends not just on how many stones, but what type of stone it is. Um, what do you got? the baby spell cabinet <laughs> she has a wand from the baby spell cabinet <laughs> are you eating your wand what you doing oh she's got her eyes on all this stuff she's like where can i get my hands on what can i grab do you see those little eyes like ooh, very cool um Oh, no, I still haven't received one of the giveaways I won at the end of last year. I think I did send you two different things. So, yeah, you can email me, but you should have gotten a um, uh, tracking number for those. But I do remember sending you two things. So let me know and I will look up the tracking and see where it is um, or if I missed something. But... Thank you guys so much for being here on Friday this week. We will go live again at 4 p.m. We're live Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays now um, up until, like I said, through at least through March. And um, Friday, we're just going to do kind of a normal coffee chat. So we don't have to just talk about the witch's key stuff. So Christabel, um, I know she had to go. I think she said she had some bad weather going, but she will probably post a question um, in the coven if you are in my Facebook group. If not, feel free to join the link to join us down below. And otherwise, we'll just be kind of chatting a little bit on Friday. And then next week, we will be doing some more um, kind of inside the witch's key type things, as well as some recaps on what is going on in the... Um, <laughs> <laughs> on what is going on in that first book in case you missed it or you want a little bit of a refresh. You want to get down? You want to hold this? You want to eat it? Okay. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you on Friday. Bye. And don't forget the thumbs up. And I will see you then. Okay. Bye-bye. You going to say bye? Yeah, she's going to smile. Bye. Bye, everybody.